Um, we'd now like to start the main program with the recitation of Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كاف ها يا عين صاد ذكر رحمة ربك عبده زكريا إذ نادى رب بَهُ نَدَاءٌ خَفِيَّ قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَهَنَ الْعَظْمُ مِنِّي وَاشْتَعَلَ الرَّأْسُ شَيْبًا وَاشْتَعَلَ الرَّأْسُ شَيْبًا وَلَمْ أَكُمْ بِدُعَائِكَ رَبِّ شَقِيًّا وَإِنِّي خُفْتَ الْمَوَالِي مِنْ وَرَائِي وَكَانَتْ مَرَأَتِي عَاقِرًا وَكَانَتْ مَرَأَتِي عَاقِرًا فَهَبْ لِي مِنْ لَدُنْكَ وَلِيًّا يَرِثُنِي وَيَرِثُ مِنْ آلِي يَعْقُوبَ وَاجْعَلْهُ رَبِّي رَضِيًّا يا زكريا إنا نبشرك بغلام اسمه يحيى لم نجعل له من قبل سميا قال رب إن قال رب أن يكون لي غلام وكانت مرأتي عاقرة وكانت مرأتي عاقرا وقد بلغت من الكبر عتيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هيا وقد خلقتك من قبل ولم تك شيئا قال رب اجعل لي آية قال آيتك ألا تكلم الناس ثلاث ليال سويا فخرج على قومه من المحراب فأوحى إليهم أن سبحوا بكرة وعشيا يا يحيى خذ الكتاب بقوة وآتيناه الحكم صبيا وحنانا من لدنا وزكاة وزكاة وكان تقيا وبر وبرا بوالديه ولم يكن جبارا عصيا وسلام عليه يوم ولد ويوم يموت ويوم يبعث حيا واذكر في الكتاب مريم إذ انتبذت من أهلها مكانا شرقيا فاتخذت من دونهم جحجابا فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت أن قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال, قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب, لأهب لك, لك غلاما زكيا قالت أنا يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك قال ربك قال, قال ربك هو علي هيا ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة منا وكان أمرا مقضيا صلوات Thank you very much for the recitation. We are now very fortunate to have Namilia Ramdani who will be speaking to us on her latest book, Fixing France, How to Repair a Broken Republic. Let's welcome her. Salat ala Muhammad wa al-Muhammad.
Namila is a French author of Algerian descent who works as a journalist, academic and broadcaster. She began her award-winning journalistic career at the BBC Paris Bureau. She's since broadcast for outlets including Sky, Al Jazeera and CNN and has written extensively for The Guardian, The Daily Mail, The Washington Post and others. Educated at the Paris um, uh, University and the London School of Economics, Nabila has taught at the University of Oxford and the University of Michigan and Arba. And we're very fortunate to have her here today speaking to us on her book. Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum everyone and uh, wa jum'a mubaraka. Thank you so much for having me here and thank you so much Migdad for inviting me. It's so wonderful actually to be here in the Mafilali Ali uh, Center. It's such a vibrant mosque uh, which offers such a wide uh, range of uh, activities from religious, social and actually educational um, activities in a very historic area. Uh, so I'm particularly honored to have been invited uh, to speak here, to be part of this uh, dynamic hub uh, of the Muslim community, to come together and learn and engage on various uh, issues, uh, to deepen our uh, values and indeed strengthen uh, our connections. So I'm hugely grateful um, to be speaking here tonight and thank you all of you for, for coming along. I'm absolutely delighted to be talking about my new book, which is called Fixing France, How to Repair a Broken Republic. The book's title is pretty straightforward. The book is about what it says on the cover. It looks at a range of issues in France and considers how things might be improved. The aim of my book is to cut through the myths and describe a country where there is mass dissent and where political institutions are considered by many to be unfit for purpose in a rapidly changing France, and there I say, in a rapidly changing world. And perhaps the major fault line I describe is the absurd amount of power invested in one president, and indeed the very real danger that this one president might soon be a full-blown extremist. At present, Marine Le Pen, a former presidential candidate from a party steeped in racism against Jews and indeed Muslims and against immigrants per se, believes that she has a very good chance of becoming head of state in 2027. She was runner-up in the last two presidential elections, despite only having a handful of MPs in Parliament and no senators. And this is a prime example of how rotten the system is. Extremism fosters, as it always does, when traditionally moderate political groupings focus on looking after wealthy elites and fail to reform the system they operate in. And while politics is clearly crucial to my book, there are in fact 10 themes explored in 10 chapters and they include uh, economic injustice, segregated suburbs, the state of French feminism and the debasement of women, terrorism, institutionalized rioting and paramilitary policing, deep-seated racial and religious discrimination, and the rise of the far right as exemplified by Le Pen and her dynastic party. And I'd like to think that Fixing France is a very readable guide to what's going on in a very interesting country, as well as being a compelling analysis of deep fault lines. The big difference between Fixing France and similar books on the market is that I'm by no means a traditional writer from France. On the contrary, I'm a Muslim who was born and grew up on a French housing estate. My family background is in Algeria, which was once France's most prestigious colony 
the absolute jewel in the crown of the French Empire. Unlike similar imperial jewels, such as British India, Algeria was considered to be part of mainland France. It had its own MPs in the Paris National Assembly, French town halls, and more than a million or so so-called Pied-Noir settlers from Europe. The indigenous Arab Muslim population was treated appallingly, not only in Algeria, but also on the French mainland, where many were sent to rebuild France after the Second World War. I mean rebuild literally, rather than metaphorically. The Algerians were largely viewed as cheap labor without any significant political or social rights. This year is the 70th anniversary of the start of the Algerian War of Independence in 1954. This cataclysmic conflict ended with victory for the Algerian nationalists in 1962. And its legacy still has an enormous influence on modern France. The current makeshift Fifth Republic literally emerged from the Algerian war. The hugely powerful institution of the French presidency, an alpha male, the president of France has so far always been a male, with a vast security apparatus behind him, including thousands of paramilitaries, was designed to deal with the Algerian insurgents. Algerians were treated with great suspicion then, just as they are today. Thus, my North African background often excludes me from France's national story. I was born to Algerian parents in Paris. I was educated in Paris. I have a French passport. Yet there are many French people who do not acknowledge that I am French because of my origins, because of my appearance, and many like me are pushed into lives on the periphery. And my early views of the French Republic were from one of the neglected suburbs of Paris. And accordingly, my first memories are of concrete residential blocks. In fact, you know, whole ethnic minority communities are pushed to live on out of town um, estates that former socialist prime minister, Manuel Valls, said, contributed to, and I quote, a social, ethnic, and territorial apartheid in France. Worse than that, ethnic minority groups are often stigmatized and portrayed in all kinds of unpleasant ways and are often the victims of police brutality. I make such strong points in my book, but fear not. Fixing France is not, um, you know, a, a misery memoir. It's not a long series of complaints. Ultimately, it's a call for change. And in this sense, it's a disruptive book, but in a positive way. And it follows in the great French tradition of dissenting progress. And again, my book uh, analyze, uh, analyzes lots of key subjects from politics and economics to feminism and protests. And it doesn't shy away from very difficult issues. And I think this is very important. We're currently living through one of the most hor ter terrible and, and indeed horrible episodes of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to date. And that really highlights what troubled times we live in. Discussing these issues causes immense pain and anguish for many, as much as division 
and discord. And the easy option is often to avoid getting involved, not to take a position. But I really think that we all owe to the world to try and join the debate and to try to make a difference. A key theme of my book is that France is built on dissent and the French still revere their revolutions, especially the one in 1789. Paris itself is one of the most celebrated protest cities in the world. It has been at the forefront of idealistic challenges to injustice and oppression throughout the centuries and all involve insurrection. Years such as 1789, 1830, 1848 and 1871, when the doomed Paris Commune briefly gained power, all these years are forever associated with uprisings. There was civilian resistance that contributed to the end of the Nazi occupation in 1944. And there's also the apparent watershed of May 1968, when a mass movement of, made up of Paris students and trade unionists shook Europe's old order. All these dates are still celebrated. You do not have to agree with a protester's cause to concede that he or she has a right to take to the streets. Whether marching peacefully as many do when permitted by the authorities, or fighting the police, tearing up the pavement, setting fire to cars and property, demonstrating in France is viewed as a sacred right that frequently overrides basic laws concerned with keeping the peace. Well, that's with the exception of pro-Palestine demonstrations when the authorities literally decide when those marches should go ahead or not. I don't want our discussion, you know, to change too much into the horrific events connected to the, um, uh, the, 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 the war on Gaza and the general conflict in the Middle East, because that would take us away from France uh, completely. But I do want to make the point that the current French government thinks nothing of banning protests, despite the country being built on protest, violent protest, even terrorism. The banning of demonstrations in support of Palestine has an inglorious history in France, despite the country being home to millions with families or, or close cultural links to the Middle East, they are encouraged not to show their solidarity in public and certainly not en masse. Many French Muslims are linked to former French colonies, such as Algeria, which went through an occupation that was every bit um, as brutal as the kind going on in Gaza and the West Bank. And their support for the Palestinian is thus rooted in calls for justice. And this has been the case for decades. But anybody who has attended pro-Palestine marches in Paris or elsewhere in France would have noticed that you don't have to be an Arab or indeed a Muslim to call for justice. In fact, you'll find people from every walk of life, from every skin color, from every faith denomination, or indeed no faith denomination. A classic example of the way the French authorities actively encourage confrontation and indeed violence is the way they try to ban such major demonstrations. This happened in 2014, for example, when President Francois Hollande, nominally a socialist, abandoned his man of the people liberal roots to throw his supports behind, behind a, a ban on Paris's vast pro-Palestine movement protesting against the attack on Gaza. 
exactly the same is happening today. Gérald Darmanin, the current interior minister, has even expressed a desire to lock up demonstration organizers and to fine anybody who turns up at an illegal demonstration. He argues that Palestine supporters are too unruly for their own gatherings and will create disorder. Now, such a view is quite absurd when you consider how every single major protest in France invariably ends up in rioting, whether it involves the Gilets Jaunes, the so-called Yellow Vests protest movement, or the huge numbers from every generation who opposed President Emmanuel Macron's pension reforms earlier this year. And as we've seen, fighting, arson attacks, tear gas, and baton charges were common when they got together, just as common as banners and loudspeakers. Yet nobody has ever suggested that they should be kept off the streets. And in light of such double standards, the quote, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend it to the death your right to say it, which is forever associated with the Paris-born 18th century writer and civil rights champion, François-Marie Arouet, or Voltaire, as he's better known, this phrase couldn't sound more hollow. Voltaire didn't actually coin that phrase. It was his English biographer, Evelyn Beatrice Holt, who did. So you have the English to blame for that. But another example of the major problems that Muslims have to deal with in France is the way they are seen as an easy scapegoat. Just look at the way everything is done to stigmatize Muslim women and to spread collective guilt against the communities that they come from. Now, creating an underclass and a dangerous underclass full of undesirables who present a threat to society is a classic tactic of rebel rousers and French politicians are highly adept at using dress to do so. There was a much vaunted so-called burqa ban a decade ago or so, and now even the abaya is pinpointed as being so closely associated with Islam and thus being an affront to French secularism. So this is the latest Muslim dress polemic uh, that's emerging out of France, which is about banning girls in state schools from wearing the abaya. The uh, then education minister, Gabriel Attal, who's now been elevated to prime minister at the, a, at the age of 34, at the time he said that it was in line, I mean, the ban was in line with France's strict uh, secularism laws ones that ban religious symbols in most public spaces. But in fact, Abaya says more about a wearer's cultural links with Africa or the Middle East. And enforcers of the ban will certainly find it hard to tell the difference between a loose-fitting Abaya and an other types of long dress. So they end up looking at the skin color. If, say, Fatima wears a long dress, then it's perceived as an abaya, and Fatima is not allowed in school. But if the exact same dress, often from a high street shop, by the way, is, say, worn by Sandrine, who is white, then it's just a long dress, and she can attend school. The truth is that France's version of secularism, which is known as laïcité, has long been weaponized to discriminate against Muslim women in multiple fields, from education to sport. The ambiguous and very confusing edicts linked to laicity also regularly violate religious freedom, something they are not meant to do. 
So laïcité is the diktat which prevents expression of religion in public life. Crucially, it doesn't officially ban religion, but it ensures that it's kept out of public affairs or indeed the affairs of the state. But there are far more venal reasons for politicians wanting to be seen to be doing something about Muslims. And the obsession with what Muslim women wear is always a perfect excuse. I highlight in my book how Macron spread fake news about Muslim parents allegedly putting their daughters, aged three or four, in burqas or full-face veils, and I quote, raising them in hatred of France's values. Macron had no evidence whatsoever for those sulfurous claims, and yet they were published in a letter he wrote for the Financial Times in a column called Simple Facts. Now, this article, this letter, continues to fuel intense hatred towards Muslims living on under resorts, housing estates, on the edge of, on the edge of major cities such as Paris, Paris or Marseille. In fact, the burqa, as they call it in, in France, or the niqab, is actually banned in France, and anyone would face a potential prison sentence if they forced a child to wear one. There is not a single recorded incident of a child in a burqa, let alone any prosecutions or convictions. Instead, there were numerous calls and emails correspondence that were made to relevant bodies, from France's interior ministry to police and prosecutors, and they have not yielded supporting facts. Sources there were all baffled by such sensational and reckless fantasies, ones that would instantly make front-page news if they were true. In an era when cameras are everywhere, there were no images to back up Macron's fabrications. Even the Financial Times barrister, the Complaints Commissioner, stated in his adjudication that, I quote, he was highly skeptical of the term full veil being used in respect of the head coverings uh, worn by girls at this age. And he added that he had, again I quote, no general jurisdiction to fact check or adjudicate statements by world leaders or others who appear in the news, end of quote. In other words, he had let Macron off the hook over fake news. Now disgracefully, Macron even actually wrote that Muslim majority Estates had become, and these are his words, breeding grounds for terrorists in France. Now note the vile biological metaphor too with the word breeding. The implication is that pretty much all of France's Muslims, five million plus Muslims, are doomed to a life of crime from birth. Now all of this fitted in with Macron's much-vaunted clampdown uh, against so-called Islamists, Islamist separatism, a new legislation that was meant to tackle uh, or to deal with um, Muslims who live on the kind of estates that Macron referenced in his FT letter. The focus is on increased security and mon monitoring and indeed controlling Muslims, especially those who identify themselves as such by wearing hijabs or similar. Such initiatives are the sort normally associated with the Rassemblement National or the National Rally, the Le Pen family party. The National Rally, which used to be the National Front, is still widely supported by racists, anti-Semites, and of course, Islamophobes. 
The most prominent remains Jean-Marie Le Pen, its founder, and Marine Le Pen's father. Not only does Le Pen Sr. have numerous criminal convictions for stirring up hatred, but like his daughter, he has long been a fierce opponent of women wearing the wrong type of garment. Now, that Macron, who came to power as a liberal, centrist, apparently committed to tolerance and respect, has joined them in this obsession with dress should concern anyone who is worried about the fragmentation of the French Republic, and especially its increasingly despicable treatment of ethnic and religious minorities. A solution to all this, I argue in my book, would be for France to start taking the abuse of religious and ethnic minorities seriously. At present, the Republic views itself as colorblind, which is to say that it doesn't recognize ethnic or indeed religious differences. It doesn't compile any kind of statistics pointing to racism or discrimination. And this is, of course, absurd and needs to change. I've tried to make my book as honest as possible and to write it in a way that will appeal to anybody, no matter what their background. And the clearest message I'd like to offer you all tonight is that the book is a very straightforward read. It draws on um, historical, political, and cultural factors, but also my lived experience, my real life experiences. It is not a stodgy academic theory. It is not a political manifesto. It's about my real life experiences and indeed about a modern republic that is failing to live up to its once exalted reputation of liberty, equality, and fraternity for all. So in brief, France is undergoing an identity crisis and there is every reason for those of us who care to highlight those failures, failures that are both inherited and new. So I very much hope that you will give Fixing France a chance and that you will indeed enjoy reading it. And in the meantime, I would welcome your questions for a discussion. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, we do have uh, time for questions. Is there questions from either side? Salaam alaikum, Nabila. Thanks for coming to speak to us, and hopefully, he keeps calm. Um, I guess one of the big questions I have is: we we know that Islamophobia has been on the rise so for so long in France, um, and Macron for I mean for the longest time has not been a friend of Muslims, and we've seen that on a number of occasions. Um, and you know the the groups that were tracking Islamophobic incidents, for example, being counted as being classified as terrorists um, and, and things like that. <laughs> uh, sorry, baby got taken away. Um, but I guess the one big question I had of is that given the number of Muslims in the country, why are they so disenfranchised? Why is there no one who is standing up for them? Or do they, do they have no voice? Do they have no vote? Like what's the, what's the situation in the political ground that they, that they have nothing to help them? Well, that's a very important question, and I think it also reflects on the nature of, of politics in France. I think a lot of... Th there's a sense of disillusionment uh, across French society, and not just for people from uh, ethnic or indeed religious uh, minority backgrounds. As you uh, would have been aware, you know, France is regularly... Um, marred by um, street protests. And this also affects, you know, white working class people from rural communities. So all these communities really feel that there is no sense of fraternity at all. And they feel that they are part of the left behind France because the system is designed to look after the wealthy elites. And 
I think it needs, uh, France needs an overhaul of its system of governance in order to allow people uh, who feel let down to mm, join in the democratic um, functioning of, of France and, and care about going to vote, for example. And I would contend that, you know, the roots of the Fifth Republic in the Algerian War of Independence are very important to understand why there is still so much discrimination in France. Um, French Arab Muslims were viewed uh, as second-class citizens then. They're still treated in the same way. And and I think that's what, what creates this disillusionment with the political class. And the very fact, I mean, one of the main arguments I made in the book is that um, there really needs to be profound, uh, a profound reform of the presidential uh, mode of governance at the moment, um, because it allows effectively one single individual to run the whole show. So if you are capable of winning a, a two-round election, you end up controlling the whole system. You can uh, choose your prime minister. You can form your cabinet. Uh, they don't have to be elected politicians. They can be close friends or business cronies. The French president doesn't need a coalition to govern. He can rule by decree. He can bypass parliament, as has been the case uh, very often under the Macron's two terms. Um, his last prime minister, um, a very lackluster woman who was essentially in charge of rubber stamping his legislation. I mean, he used her to rubber stamp uh, at least 20 times, 20 legislations that were passed by decree. Are you not going to the National Assembly to debate and indeed vote on legislation? And that's over a period of about 20 months. And I would contend that he brought in this very young and inexperienced prime minister just to do that, to rubber stamp whatever policy he wants to, to push through. And that's really something that needs to change because, you know, people were angry at the fact that Macron pushed through the, his retirement uh, legislation, uh, bringing the age of, reti of retirement in France from 62 to 64, without going to the National Assembly for voting for votes. So just imagine what a Marine Le Pen could do. She could rule just like him, by decree, bypassing parliament, nominating uh, a very extreme prime minister, and bring about the most discriminatory policies, or worse. And she can easily form a, an alliance with even more unsavory uh, characters, even more to the far right than her, such as Eric Zemmour, for example, who believes in the great replacement theory, which is an absolutely racist uh, theory. Um, and it won't be hard to unite that lot because th they, they effectively put an anti in front of any policy statement, whether it's globalization, whether it's Europe, whether it's immigration, whether it's Islam, and so that is a real um, concern in a view of the 2027 uh, presidential elections. Um, not least of all because President Macron has actually allowed uh, the ideas of the far right to penetrate French society so um, widely that he's effectively preparing the ground for for, uh, for such a presidency. I mean, he keeps claiming that he wants to ward off, you know, the far right from gaining power, but he just tried to push uh, to, through an immigration bill that's highly contentious, that goes against France's principles of human rights, uh, you know, keeping 
uh, immigrants away, uh, or introducing all sorts of quotas and, restri and restrictions to bring family pay uh, members uh, to France, or introducing what they call the national preference. Now, the Constitutional Council ruled yesterday that it was, I mean, the vast majority of the articles of the, the, the proposed bill were rejected, thankfully, but it doesn't mean that those ideas have gone away. So it, you know, you need to give people an incentive that they can believe in a system that will indeed protect them and treat them, you know, as the motto of the French Republic, you know, pretends uh, to project uh, so they can have freedom, liberty, and be treated e equally. But at the moment, we have a political system that's geared toward protecting a minority and an, an, an elitist minority. And that's why the, the tag, president of the rich, is often, often attributed to Emmanuel Macron. Hi, assalamu alaikum. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering what the motivation was behind writing your book and what do you hope um, it will achieve? Um, obviously, the, the answer is probably from the title that it fixes France, but if you're saying that usually people like you are on the periphery and push to the periphery, and if that's the case, who's actually going to then listen and who's going to implement whatever you've recommended in the book? Mm. Well, you know, I think, I mean, before writing my book, I have been consistently writing about French politics um, in opinion pieces, um, mainly in a, the British media. I'm sorry, just, sorry, just one second, sorry. Um, uh, just a quick announcement. Um, if you haven't picked up your child from next door, please do so. Um, uh, the games area is closing right now. Thank you. Sorry, continue. So always the aim of my writing was to draw attention to fault lines, but also at ways to remedy those fault lines. And... I have often been accused, it has to be said, by the French political class or indeed the elites, that I was being anti-patriotic. So that's often a criticism that's been leveled at me. But as I make clear in my book, and I start off by quoting the great American and indeed writer and indeed Francophile, James Baldwin, who visited France in the 1940s. He arrived in, in Paris in 1948. And he writes about his own country, America, and he writes, I love America more than any other country in this world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. And I guess that's exactly, you know, it sums up this kind of unhelpful commentary sum up how people like me are perceived in, in France. I'm not seen as French. Uh, any constructive criticism level that my country, where I was born and raised, is seen as an attack on the country. It cannot be more positive to highlight flaws in order to bring about change. And I think that's why I think I was more determined uh, to write this book. You know, they say you write about what you know, and I know masses about modern France and its problems. But I also was determined to write this book because of the very intricate link between the foundation of the Fifth Republic and the Algerian War of Independence. And I think this is where the original problem stems from. Um, it is a republic that was built with the intent of, you know, repressing people like me. Um, 
the context in which it was brought about was very fraught. Uh, we were at the height of the Algerian war in the 1950s. Uh, France was on the brink of a civil war because you, on the one hand you had Algerian nationalists who were determined to gain freedom and liberate the country from the French. But on the other hand, you had a fierce French patriots, French nationalists, who wanted to cling on to French Algeria. And so General Charles de Gaulle, the wartime hero, was brought out of the political wilderness, and he was asked to impose military rule over that chaos. And his condition to come back to power was that the constitution would give him extraordinary powers and act as a strong man with huge paramilitary units to keep everybody in check. That was considered an emergency measure at a time of intense trouble when there were discussions about the right to self-determination for Arab Muslim populations. But 65 years on, whoever became president of France retains those absurd powers. And they are still used in the same way to keep those who are perceived as the enemy within in check. So when you see those vast paramilitary units, they literally stem from the colonial era. And they, are still, they still exist today, and they're still used to repress people from different ethnic and um, religious backgrounds. And for a society to achieve peace with itself, cohesion, and indeed to live up to all those high-minded principles that underpin the foundation of the Fifth Republic, liberty, equality, fraternity, but also to live up to the tradition of enlightenment, of human rights uh, that France projects around the world. Now, all these values that are envied around the world do not apply to people like me. And that's something that needs urgent fixing if France wants to be considered as the enlightened country it pretends to be. And it takes somebody like me to write, uh, to highlight this problem, because of course, you know, the elites who are primarily white, uh, who come from the right background, who have the right connections, have the right education, have vested interests, and they have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. But that's not, you know, that's not conducive to a, a cohesive society uh, that's literally built on immigration. And France needs to adapt to a changing world and acknowledge that diversity is actually an asset. It's not something to uh, be uh, suppressed. And that's literally what drove me to write this book. And also very aware that you know, the book industry is dominated by a certain type and I wanted to fill that gap. I wanted to show that people like me who come from a more modest, a more immigrant, council estate background could reflect on the state of their nation and hopefully could be taken seriously because I, I hope that it will lead France to do some soul searching and reflect on the values it was built on and uh, it's not just me saying all these uh, things. You know, France is regularly criticized by, you know, human rights organizations in the way they uh, repress legitimate protests, in the way they treat women, in the way they treat minorities. And they don't even have to be Muslim women. Because if you look at the state of, you know, the violence against women, um, domestic abuse, for example, and also, Sinister quirks, for example, um, uh, one of the baffling debates that France is having at the moment is how to deal, you know, they see the Me Too movement, for example, that emerged in America, 
where women started to speak up against all sorts of abuse, they see it as a disgraceful import from Anglo-Saxon cultures. But that means that they are very keen on stifling women's voices. And in actual fact, if you look at how the judiciary works in France, it is slow, it is ineffect ineffective, and it's aimed at protecting the rich and powerful who are involved in this kind of conduct. And you only have to look at uh, you know, the, the, the government itself, where the um, interior minister was accused of rape, where you know, several of Macron's previous ministers were also involved in um, similar, similar allegations were made against him. The president himself came out recently in favor of a, um, an actor who is seen as a, you know, a legend in France as far as French cinema is concerned. But why it is not the place of the head of state to interfere with the judiciary and determine who's guilty or who's not, while um, demeaning the voices of women and indeed the very real evidence that has been put forward in the cases against Gérard uh, Depardieu, to name him. So there's an attitude in France that is counterproductive. And again, it's, a, it's an elite reproducing itself where there are too many vested interests and they want to cling on to an old view of the world. They don't want to acknowledge that the world has moved on. And that is detrimental to France's social fabric, that is detrimental to its advancement in the world, that is detrimental to its position on the world stage, it's detrimental to you know, a, a healthy functioning society. So in actual facts, this kind of criticism is very healthy. It's almost like telling a family friend, you know, a, a, fam a member of your family or a friend, that they should you know, watch their conduct or improve their ways. Um, but there is uh, resistance, and uh, it's very hard to change mindsets, because, and the, the, the root cause of all this, I go back to the yawning deficit in democracy. And by that I mean, I don't just mean the, uh, the absolutely, uh, you know, um, the, the major flaw in the presidential system, as opposed to a more healthy parliamentary uh, form of governance, a cabinet uh, government that actually uses uh, parliament to pass legislation. But the deficit in democracy also manifests itself in um, uh, the lack of democracy in um, civil um, institutions, uh, the press, uh, for example, the media in general, uh, the courts, um, you know, the way uh, those paramilitaries are not being kept under civil, civil rule, for example. So all this needs to um, be taken into account. Uh, so the deficit in democracy is, in my view, the root cause of the problems that affect every aspect of French life. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, we, we only have about five, ten minutes left, so if we can try and get as many questions in as we can. Let's try. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for your insights into the French system and how it fosters and benefits from racism. Uh, I, I wondered if you look a bit further um, uh, wider, in the whole of Europe, fascist parties are running on steroids. You had Meloni coming to power in Italy a couple of years ago, Gerd Welders won the Dutch elections, the AFD in Germ Germany is running at 25%, and the Swedish Democrats are the second largest party, I think. And the common thing of these is also Islamophobia, anti-migrant sentiments. So how can we fix Europe apart from France? Well, that's a very important point, because as you quite rightly say, this rise of populism and indeed populist politics is not just happening in France, it's happening across European countries, as you said, Italy, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, you know, Hungary, that happened a long time ago. 
already. And you are always going to have people who are going to um, adhere to those extremist ideas. But the problem is that constituency is growing. And it's often to do with conflating um, or wanting to attribute um, problems often linked to the economy, the cost of living, or insecurity, or a feeling of insecurity. It doesn't have, even have to be real. And the, the key word that keeps coming up is immigration. And that all these ills, or perceived ills, in European societies are being blamed on a scapegoat. And that scapegoat is Muslim at the moment. And this is very dangerous politics. There's no um, rational foundation for those arguments. They're often underpinned by very racist theories, such as the great replace replacement theories. I mean, you would have noted that all those theories originate from France. <laughs> Renaud Camus uh, is behind them. You have voices like Eric Zemmour or Michel Houellebecq. Or, and they're all influencing European politics, including Britain in voices like Douglas Murray, for example. Now, I go back to this democratic um, principle where there has to be mechanisms to keep the extremists out. And you have countries, for example, like Germany, where the coalitions work extremely well to keep out you know, um, extremis extremism from reaching power, and they can get things done in terms of passing legislation and bringing about stability. But if you don't have those democratic mechanisms, then that's when it gets very dangerous. And one thing that the civil society can keep doing is indeed keep highlighting, I mean, some, I feel very passionately about such issues as a journalist, to keep stating facts, to keep providing evidence that indeed, you know, the threat is not uh, the, the so-called enemy within. We live in a globalized world where issues such as immigration, for example, are hugely contentious because they are very difficult to sort out. You have people who live in blighted parts of the world who nowadays, thanks to technology, can see exactly where they can have a better life. Often, they are in countries where there have been devastating Western intervention that obliterated you know, their societies, if not the lives of their families and friends. And so it's very difficult to keep away, I mean, to prevent people from tr seeking to better their lives. Now, a lot of people have legitimate cases, for example, to claim asylum. And in spite of all that, or to test the asylum claims anyway, and in spite of all that, there's every resistance to prevent those people from um, making those claims or indeed testing the system. Now, Western societies have a duty of care especially when they've conducted themselves so recklessly in often former colonies or in Commonwealth countries. And we also see the double standards apply to immigrants. When it comes to white European immigrants from Ukraine, for example, then we should open our doors wide open even though it often involves inviting, as Boris Johnson had suggested, hardened you know, soldiers into your homes. Literally, the government was giving grants for welcoming people who were on the front line one day to come to your home the next day. Now, that's not helpful to anyone, but what it shows, with no ambiguity whatsoever, is the double standards. If you're white, European, and Christian, you're in. 
if you're dark-skinned Muslim and come from a country that's often been ravaged and destroyed by Western countries, you stay out. Now, as I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist and I believe in um, strong institutions such as the judiciary, such as the law. And now you see it with the Rwanda plan, for example, which has been tested a number of times. And thankfully, rationality, the law, you know, keeps pointing to politicians that it cannot deprive people of their human rights. The same thing has just happened in France with the Constitutional Council rejecting what were anti-human rights um, articles in that proposed law. So I think the solution is to constantly seek to buttress our institutions, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the media, whether it's civil society, to push back in the legal way. And protest is part of that. And this is the only way to resist injustice, to reinforce, to strengthen institutions so that the rule of law, so that human rights, so that you know, decent views of the world, and dare I say often common sense, prevails. And, and in that sense, we have a duty as citizens to get involved. We can't just look at things and you know, shy away, as I was saying, from participating, because it will be to our detriment. If you are not at the dinner table, you will end up on the menu. So that's why we need to dig in. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Just our very last question on the side. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nabila. <coughs> um, just one question, I, it's the background. Do you think France can grow without further immigration? Do you have enough people of working age to make it work, or you need immigration? Well, it's, you know, France was built on immigration, and uh, currently the figures are that 32% of the French population under the age of 60 have a migrant ancestry. And there is no doubt whatsoever that immigration has contributed to literally not only rebuild France after the Second World War. Uh, my own father was called not after the Second World War, because he's not of a, a more recent uh, generation, but certainly in the 70s, where France still needed reconstruction, he was called in to come and rebuild the country. And he did what, you know, people who integrate do. He um, started a family and he settled in France. And that's what is expected from immigrants, to integrate. And I think the question is not whether France currently needs immigrants or doesn't. The question is how agenda-led politicians portray different types of immigrants. And they are very consistent and serious uh, sociological studies that show that if you look at the wave of immigrants who came to France after the First World War, in the interwar period, they tended to be white, European, Christian, from countries such as Italy, Portugal, Spain, uh, for example. And they actually tended to integra integrate far less into France. They tended to retreat into communities and live, you know, isolated from mainstream French society. If you look at the wave of immigrants who came after the Second World War, they tended to be more brown-skinned from Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa or North Africa, Muslim, usually former colonies of France, 
And they are actually the ones who integrated far better. And there's a very logical reason for that. It's because they were colonized. They knew the French from close up, maybe too close. Uh, they could speak French. And if you look at the Algerian community, for example, they are the ones who married the most outside of their community. So there's no ambiguity that actually they integrated far better into French society. But there's a, a, a sinister uh, agenda by politicians to portray them otherwise and to portray them as a problem within French society because they are the different skin, they are the wrong skin color, because they have the wrong religion, because they look different. But in actual fact, they have contributed far more than the ones who are perceived to have integrated better. So I think it's a matter of perception. And as often, when you manipulate facts, you breed extremism. And that's very dangerous because you always end up, you know, pushing a very dangerous agenda where you need a scapegoat. And at the moment, the scapegoat is very much a Muslim. It's a Muslim man, it's a Muslim woman. And, and, and that is really what we see, not just in France, but as this uh, gentleman said, uh, across Europe. And if not, you know, dare I say, in a, in a country like America, where we might see uh, the resurgence of, I mean, the comeback of a Trump presidency and his infamous bans on Muslims, his infamous stigmatizations of, of Muslims. So we're living in very different very difficult times, but it doesn't mean that we don't have the resources to put the narrative straight and to use all the uh, legal uh, mechanisms, and indeed the strengths of our civil society to push back and to challenge those narratives. Thank you very much. We're very, uh, we're very happy to have had the opportunity to, to listen to you today and to have your, uh, your, your thoughts on your book. Um, for those who, are, uh, who haven't uh, been able to read it so far, uh, her book is available uh, on the right-hand side, um, available for a very cheap price of £10 only. It's £22 in the shops normally, so £10 only you can get it here. Please do if you'd like. And um, She's very uh, graciously uh, accepted the... the, the duty of signing the book if, if you'd like that to happen as well. Um, so please do um, take that opportunity today. Uh, we're very fortunate to have, um, so, so thank you very much. Uh, and please give her a round of applause as well. Um, just a couple of quick announcements for next week. Uh, next week we have, um, we were supposed to have Dr. Tahar al faqi who's the chairman of the Legislative Assembly um, in Sudan, talking about the, the biggest, big challenges uh, facing Sudan, but he's being called by the Sudanese president um, to, uh, to, to advise him on to what to do in a, in a conference there, so uh, he's unable to make